Gas turbine powered cars have been developed and tested over the years by various auto companies, most of which are one-off experimental vehicles or simply design studies that never were intended in a production. Despite the futuristic appeal of a car powered by something more advanced than a conventional piston engine, a gas turbine automobile engine is mechanically like an aircraft jet engine, the difference being that the turbine is connected to a conventional automobile transmission to propel the car, whereas a jet engine propels a plane with the thrust generated. Despite years of research and development, no turbine car entered production. However, one turbine car project did almost lead to a mass-produced vehicles, which was Chrysler's turbine car of the mid-1960s. Up to this point, Chrysler had already spent a little more than a decade developing and testing turbine engines in a variety of otherwise standard versions of the company's production cars. And by early 1962, the decision was made to embark on the most ambitious effort to put a turbine car on the road, the turbine car and the driver test program. Immediately prior to this, the company had unveiled to the public their Turbo Fury and Turbo Dark cars, both standard Chrysler cars equipped with the examples of the company's fourth generation of turbine engine. These cars were driven in a December 1961 cross-country demonstration trip, and at this time, company officials had hinted at a possible test drive program involving members of the public. The official announcement was made on February 14, 1962 at the Chicago Auto Show that 50 turbine cars would be built and made available to select users by the end of 1963 to evaluate the cars under different driving conditions. During a nationwide dealership promotional tour, questionnaires were sent to people visiting the dealerships who expressed further interest and 80% of those persons answered and returned them. By this time, engine development had already progressed through four iterations of design, and it was this fourth generation design that was selected for use in the turbine cars for the driver test program. Examples of the engine had already been put through both extensive static testing as well as in other vehicles, and was rated at 130 horsepower and 420 foot-pounds of torque which was comparable to the company's hem you know, Hemi engine of the period. In addition to the power achieved with the engine, one of the engines lasted for 5,000 hours in static testing compared to the 3,000 hour operating life of a piston engine in similar testing. In the process of exploring possible designs for the car to be purpose-built for the consumer test program, more futuristic designs were rejected as the intent was to produce a more conventional contemporary design with the emphasis on the turbine engine and driver reaction to driving a conventional car powered by the turbine engine. From the beginning, the goal is to produce a turbine-powered version of the proverbial family car rather than attempting to mass produce a production version of the many futuristic and visually striking designs reflected in the concept vehicles and future-themed art of the period that ultimately would have been impractical to make into a functional vehicle for consumers to drive. For example, during the previous decade and into the early 60s, General Motors built and tested their series of four Firebird turbine-powered concept cars that were aesthetically very impressive in showcasing forward-thinking ideas in automotive design. And while undoubtedly make, making a lasting impression on people who saw them at various auto shows, they resembled wingless jet fighter aircraft or science fiction fantasy vehicles rather than anything that would have actually been on the road in the 1950s or 60s or even today for that matter. The final design for the turbine car was created by former Ford designer Elwood Engel with the Italian design studio Ghia, which specialized in handmade car bodies commissioned to construct the vehicles. Engel's previous work for Ford designing the Thunderbird was perhaps obvious to some, and the car was jokingly referred to as the Engelbird as a result. Car bodies were built in Italy and shipped to Detroit painted, and with exterior trim and interior upholstery complete, with the installation of the turbine engines, chassis, electrical system, gauges, radios, and heating systems taking place at Chrysler facility. The exterior was styled to give a space age appearance in line with the cutting edge nature of the car's turbine engine with 
fins on the headlight bezels and an aircraft inspired rear end with a special turbine bronze paint job. The interior was also turbine bronze color with leather upholstery and pile carpet and other surfaces in brushed aluminum. The dashboard was identical to that found in other cars except for the tachometer reading up to, up to 60,000 RPM as opposed to the 8,000 to 9,000 RPM common for V8 piston engines and a pyrometer gauge that displayed engine inlet temperature which ran around 1800 degrees Fahrenheit or about 1000 degrees hotter than most piston engines. One thing the cars lacked were air conditioning because the engines lack sufficient power to drive an air conditioning unit, although many cars during this time were built without standard air conditioning units. The cars were equipped with both power steering and power brakes, which were augmented by a pneumatic system to compensate for the lack of engine braking drivers were used to on piston engine cars. The transmission was a modified version of the company's torque flight automatic transmission. The transmission's use with the turbine engine allowed for a simplified lubrication system in which fluid was circulated through both the engine and transmission and not requiring the use of oil. A conventional 12 volt electrical system was not adequate enough to operate the starter to spin the turbine when starting, so a 20 volt volt system was installed. Two 12 volt batteries powered the starter, then the electrical system switched to, the, to 12 volts from one battery. Initial test drives of the first five cars built took place in early 1962. These were the five test vehicles built prior to the 50 cars assembled for the consumer test program. The designer's intent to produce a car that was both modern and practical met with success and reaction to the car's design was overall positive and people were impressed with the combination of contemporary styling and state-of-the-art technology. No official name was given to the car and they were referred to simply as Chrysler Turbine Cars or the Ghia Turbine. The car was almost named Typhoon and one car was seen being uncrated after transport from Italy in promotional footage with a Typhoon badge but all cars were ultimately badged simply as turbine. However, the Typhoon name later was used on a show car also built by Ghia with a similar style to the turbine car. Five of the 55 cars built were used by Chrysler for testing and promotions, including a world tour with one of them during the test period in August of 1963. The tour started in Geneva at Chrysler's international headquarters and lasted four months and visited 24 cities and 21 countries. The turbine engines could run on a variety of fuels which was demonstrated by running the car on tequila in Mexico, cognac in South Africa and even running it on perfume in, in, in France. Although the cars could run on the leaded gasoline that was widely available at the time it was the one fuel that drivers were discouraged from using due to being more likely to cause vapor lock during operation as well as possibly damaging the engines. Unleaded gasoline, called white gas at the time, was however listed among the fuels the cars could run on, along with diesel oil, kerosene, and JP4 fuel for aircraft jet engines. Diesel was usually the preferred fuel used by test drivers our Chrysler technicians opted for kerosene because it burned cleaner. In some demonstrations, peanut oil was used and one driver even used heating oil in their car. Availability of white gas and diesel was a challenge at the time for consumers and fuel economy fell short of expectations. However, the 16 or 17 miles per gallon achieved was comparable to a V8 powered car. Despite the advanced nature of the turbine engines, their technical simplicity greatly lessened the challenges of maintenance and repairs during testing and during the consumer test program. Besides running quietly and vibration free, it was noticed by Chrysler's engineers that the engines weren't losing power as piston engines did as wear accumulated, since in the turbine engines, moving parts weren't coming into contact with each other as was the case with piston engines. 
On cars whose engines have developed mechanical faults, rather than attempting to make repairs to the engines, mechanics replace the engine and transmission with the engine and transmission installed as a single unit. The engine was replaced by lifting the car and lowering the engine out. During the driver test program, repairs were done at dealerships after hours by technicians from Detroit to avoid the distractions of curious dealership staff and customers. As a result of the engine, transmission, and front suspension being installed as a single unit, Replacement of an engine can be done by two mechanics in half a day. The handcrafted bodies did pose a challenge when minor damage occurred as the body panels were not interchangeable among different cars. One car was not painted like the other cars. It was painted white with blue racing stripes. It was used in the 1964 movie The Lively Set. Chrysler officials forbade anyone except someone from the company to drive the car. Instead, a mechanic drove the car in scenes that weren't close-ups. A fiberglass hood was installed for a race scene in which it was set to fly off, both to add to the intensity of the scene and to show off the engine in close-ups. In the film, the car is touted as the car of the future, but the movie overall was unremarkable and the race scenes were filmed to give the illusion of speed by filming them at a lower speed, in which the film was run through the camera at a lower speed and shown sped up in the finished movie, with close-up scenes done that were clearly rear projections. Ultimately, the film was nominated for, for the Best Sound Effects Oscar, however losing out to Goldfinger. On May 14, 1963, the Ghia turbine cars were first shown to the public in New York, where the public loan test program was announced. In this program, selected drivers would be loaned one of the 50 cars, with each driver using the car for a few months. 30,000 requests were sent in, with 203 people being selected at random, limited only to current car owners and living in certain cities chosen by Chrysler. Requests for inclusion in the program were in response to the public display of the cars and announcement of the program and no official request for applications had been made. Public enthusiasm during this time was great enough that the company was receiving inquiries about how to be selected for the user program, including people sending in blank checks made out to the company. In October of 1963, the final selections were made. Each car had five drivers for three months each. Only 23 of the 203 drivers were women. However, one car, number 28, had two female drivers out of the five it was assigned to. Later in the user test program, in May of 1965, in a very interesting coincidence, one family was assigned the same car they had seen at a shopping center display the previous year. On October 29, 1963, the first driver took delivery. Each handover was an orchestrated publicity event, with the local press invited to each handover event, ensuring a large reporter turnout with the promise of a test drive. Although the drivers are given a private orientation prior to the official handover in front of the press to avoid any potential problems during the official event. The orientation included learning about the car's interior switches. Due to the unique interior design, the switches were more discreetly placed than in other cars, along with learning the eight steps to start the engine. Al although the steps were easy to learn, such as not needing to pump the accelerator when cold starting, since the engine reached operating temperature so quickly. As mentioned before, gas mileage is comparable to a V8 of the period. Mileage is poor during city driving, and drivers are told to avoid discussing gas mileage in the press when asked about it, where the perception of the press seemed intent on finding problems with the cars. The pattern for the overall program was that each of the 203 drivers was given one of the 50 cars for three months each. 
mechanics working on the cars between users reported the small items that would have gone unnoticed were pilfered by drivers prior to returning the cars. More than likely among them the turbine emblems. The legal document detailing the driver's obligations were surprisingly only one page long. Drivers were allowed to use the cars for personal driving only. No unlicensed drivers and no driving the cars outside the U.S., as well as no user attempts at maintenance. Drivers also agreed to participate in Chrysler's promotional efforts. Regarding the prohibition of unlicensed drivers driving the cars, since some families had teenage children, it is more than likely at least some unlicensed people did get in fact a chance to drive the cars. The driver's guide given to the test drivers included a caution about interest generated by the cars and to allow people to have a supervised look at the cars and not to leave the cars unattended. Uncommon to most cars at the time, the car had no exterior access to the trunk compartment or the engine. Instead, the release levers for each were inside the passenger compartment the hood release was under the dash on the driver's side and the trunk release was behind the driver's seat. Interestingly, and probably not well known at the time, was that all 55 keys to the cars were identical and there was no specific key for each car. Drivers in cold climates were obviously impressed with how fast the engine started as well as how fast the heater worked. Rather than needing to draw heat from a cooling system as well as the norm with piston engines, the car's heater drew heat from air routed from the turbine with the exhaust heat tapped and directed through the heater core and heating outside air being drawn in and venting into the passenger compartment. While most drivers drove their cars in day-to-day -day driving situations around their hometowns, two drivers drove their cars on cross-country trips and ultimately put the most miles on any of the cars during their respective three-month test periods. One driver putting 15,000 miles on his car, and another driver totaling 12,000 miles on their car. At the end of 1963, at a company meeting in Detroit for dealers, Chrysler engineer George Hebner expressed his, his and the company's optimism about the future of the turbine car However, at a Society of Automotive Engineers conference in Detroit in January of 1964, Hebner was more cautious in his optimism. In his speech, while touting the successes up to that point of the turbine program, omitted the problems encountered with the turbine engines in earlier um, tests. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And check out the other videos on this channel. And always remember, when the future was cool,